Welcome everyone to a stain on American jurisprudence, what Korematsu versus United States means for us today. Uh, my name is Moni Tong. I am a librarian here at the San Diego Central Library. I wanna thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, tonight's very special. It is the final event for the library's program series, The Rebellious Miss Breed, San Diego Public Library and the Japanese American Incarceration. This has been a quarter long series of events reflecting on Japanese American experiences during World War II and after the war and an opportunity for the library to raise awareness and encourage discussion of historical and contemporary issues faced by marginalized voices um, and in particular AAPI voices. Our project also explored San Diego Public Library history shining a spotlight on former library director, Clara Breed, who was an outspoken advocate against the Japanese American incarceration during World War II. If you are interested in learning more about Clara Breed, the project's exhibit, Call to Serve, is open in the Central Library's ninth floor art gallery um, in downtown San Diego through January 30th, or you can visit us online at sandiego.gov forward slash Miss Breed. We'd like to thank California Humanities, a partner of the National Endowment for the Arts for their support of this project. We'd also like to thank the San Diego chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League and its president, Michael Karima, for making tonight's event possible. And of course, thank you so much to our special guests tonight, uh, Dale Minami, Dr. Karen Korematsu, and Lane Nishikawa. Our program is going to last about one hour and it will be followed by a 15 minute Q&A session. If you have a question, you can pose the question in the question and answer box or in the chat. We're gonna do our best to get to everyone's questions, but please keep in mind, we do have a limited amount of time and we do need to end at 8 p.m. tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's moderator, Lane Nishikawa. Lane Nishikawa has been in the film, television and theatrical industries for over 35 years. His plays have toured to over 75 cities across the U.S., Canada, and Europe. His dramatic feature film, Only the Brave, appeared in over 18 film festivals internationally, screened in over 25 cities across the U.S., broadcast on national PBS, Showtime Television, Armed Forces Network, and distributed to over 15 countries worldwide. He was artistic director of the Asian American Theater Company in San Francisco for 10 seasons before forming Mission from Buddha Productions, a film and theater production company, which he ran for 14 years. His new company, West River Productions, just completed production of his new documentary feature film, Our Lost Years, a comprehensive examination of the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, and the film is currently touring the U.S. Please join me in welcoming Lane. Welcome, Lane. Hi, Moni. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess I'm going to uh, jump right in here. Uh, so I'd like to thank Moni Tong from the San Diego Public Library and Sharon Senzaki from the Fred T. Korematsu Institute for setting up tonight's event. And I'd like to now welcome our uh, esteemed guests. I'm going to be reading. <laughs> because I don't I want to make sure I get it right. Uh, but you know, I'll tell you something, these two people, uh, if I went down the list of awards and accolades, uh, it would take the full hour. So uh, I've got some short bios, I'm going to read to you to give you an idea. Dr. Karen Korematsu is the founder and executive director of the Fred T. Korematsu Institute and the daughter of the late civil rights icon, Fred Korematsu of Americans Advancing Justice and the PABA, the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association Law Foundation, and has signed on to various amicus briefs opposing violations of constitutional rights. Karen travels the country advocating for civil rights, ethnic studies, education, social justice, encouraging COVID-19 vaccinations in AAPI communities, and promoting the Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution held on January 30th. Karen has received numerous awards and honors, including the ACLU Chief Justice Earl Warren Civil Liberties Award, 
<laughs> the Napaba President's Award and the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies Community Leadership Award. Karen recently was recognized to serve as a State of California Education Ambassador. Let's welcome Karen. Thank you. Our next guest, Dale Manami, is the senior counsel with the law firm of Manami Tamaki LLP in San Francisco. He has been involved in significant litigation involving the civil rights of Asian Pacific Americans, their minorities, including Korematsu versus the US, United Filipinos for Affirmative Action versus California Blue Shield, first class action employment lawsuit brought by Asian Pacific Americans, Spokane JCL versus Washington State University, a class action which established an Asian American Studies program at Washington State University. Manami received his law degree from UC Berkeley and helped found the A Law Caucus and the Asian American Bar Association. He served on both California's Commission on Judicial Nominees Evaluation and Senator Boxer's Judicial Screening Committee and as chair of the Civil Liberties Public Education Fund appointed by Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton. He has received numerous awards for his work, including ABA's Thurgood Marshall Spirit of Excellence, the ABA Medal Award, and the Papa's Trailblazer Award. He has a dorm named after him uh -huh. at UC Santa Cruz and a public interest fellowship was established in his name at Berkeley Law. He has also received honorary degrees from the Pacific McGeorge and USF schools of law. So now let's welcome our two esteemed guests. So how are you guys doing? Good. So far so good. So great to have you with us tonight. Um, so our topic, Korematsu versus the U.S., what it means today. So I was asked just to do a really brief uh, uh, talk about the internment. This will be real short. And I believe most of our audience knows about the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. But for those of you who don't know everything, about it, after Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 19, it took the military and our government just 75 days to issue executive order, uh-oh, my internet connection is unstable, executive order 9066, signed by Franklin D. Roosevelt on February 19th, 1942, basically removing 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans from the West Coast and sending them to the 10 desert and swampland concentration camps spread throughout America's heartland. Karen, let's start with you. Your family owned a nursery before the war. Can you talk a little bit about what, what that, you know, this meant to your family having to leave it all behind? Uh, yeah, thank you, Lane. Uh, yes, I think, uh, I, I think for, for all Japanese Americans, uh, uh, the, the Issei were the first generation. And of course, their story of immigration is, would, would take another hour. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was the courage for them to, to, to get here to, to the West coast and, and many of them started businesses, uh, you know, just, just a, a quick backstory that, uh, the, uh, U S government had gone to Japan, uh, during the, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s to recruit, um, uh, J uh, the Japanese, uh, to work in agriculture. That's kind of the backstory. Uh, of the incarceration and uh, you know the five prefectures or counties are they were heavily the ones that were heavily uh, populated with those people that worked in agriculture. My grandfather was one of them, and actually he he ended up uh, working in the sugarcane fields first in in uh, Kauai before he came to San Francisco, uh, and then worked in the flower market uh, in San Francisco. And you know so he was able to buy land before the alien land law took into effect on August uh, 13, 19, um, um, uh, sorry, August 18th, 1913. And then after that time, if you were an immigrant, you could not own land. So it, 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 he, it was an industrial area mm -hmm. of Oakland in the San Francisco Bay area. Uh, and he, he, he built, an, uh, a it was a cut flower nursery business, built a house 
And of course, that was the, you know, that was a scary part of the executive order. What, what, they, what were they going to do? Um, as many people who had land and had homes and either they just had to let them go. Fortunately, my grandfather, uh, the banker just said that they would oversee the property, try to rent it out. But it was, of course, in rack and ruin by the time they got it back, you know, got it back. And they and they were the one the percent, uh, mind you, after the war that were able to regain their um, their their property. Uh, but but that wasn't the case for most people. Dale, you know, um, was it your grandfather that was picked up by the FBI after Pearl Harbor? Yes, it was my grandfather. He was a leader in the Gardena community, not too far from the San Diego Zoo. Um, but he was one of the leaders. He, he was a, a, a life insurance salesman of all things, but uh, he was one of the ESA leaders and uh, he was taken away really quickly and nobody knew where he was for a while. So the family uh, finally found out that he was taken to Santa Fe, eventually, Crystal City, then Santa Fe. And he had to live with uh, separately apart from our, the rest of our family, which consisted of my uh, then one-year-old brother, who was apparently a national security threat, and um, uh, my parents and, and grandmother. So uh, my father couldn't was writing letters to the attorney general, to the president, trying to figure out where he was and why he was taken away. But uh, nothing was uh, successful until they reunited many, many years later. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the legal aspect of the executive order or maybe non legal <clears throat> missed out the rest of it, Lane. Talk about the legal aspects of the 9066. Yeah, I'm sorry, did I cut out? Yeah, you cut out. Um, oh, hey, I was just saying if you could just talk a little bit about, you know, the legal aspect of the executive order or non-legal, because you and I talked about this in our interview uh, right. a it's, couple years it's ago. It's a pretty long story, so let me try to give you the Reader's Digest truncated version. Basically, uh, the, the president issued an order not naming Japanese Americans by name, but clearly referring to them, and allowed the military commander of the West Coast to make all the decisions. Uh, the decisions were to first a curfew against uh, uh, aliens and Japanese Americans, whether they were citizens or not. Later came the banishment orders for Japanese Americans to leave the West Coast areas, which led to their imprisonment. Uh, the cases that were brought were by three men initially, uh, Fred Korematsu, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Minyasui in Portland, uh, Seattle, and uh, San Francisco area. They uh, were convicted because there are only two things you had to show is that you didn't leave the military area or you violated the curfew and you were of Japanese ancestry, whether you were a citizen or not. The cases went to the Supreme Court, and these men argued that it was race discrimination to single out Japanese Americans, violation of the due process clauses of the United States Constitution, the violations of search and seizure, the right to an attorney. They had no right to a trial. Uh, they had no right to notice of charges, all things that we obviously take for granted these days. The Supreme Court, in a really uh, meek decision, deferred to the president. They had no evidence uh, of any disloyalty. Not one Japanese American was arrested for any kind of espionage or sabotage. So they had to manufacture a record. And the record was so poor that the court kind of filled in the blanks here, saying that, well, <clears throat> Japanese, uh, because of their ethnicity, have a propensity, propensity for disloyalty because they sent their ch children to Japanese schools they uh, worshiped the Shinto uh, religion, all, all kinds of peripheral facts that did not point to one single incident of uh, violations of law. Uh, but the Supreme Court was under a lot of pressure in 1943 and 44. Uh, most of them were appointed by the president whose orders they were uh, adjudicated. It's like having your, your parents as the referee of your basketball game. and. Uh, Eventually, the, the, in a very weak decision, the Supreme Court upheld all of these orders to allow these massive 
racial profiling lead to the convictions and uh, upholding the convictions. Um, and the court uh, cloaked their decision in this magniloquence of, uh, you know, the greatest, only the greatest uh, imminent threat uh, justifies such deprivations of human rights. And they saw these really nice words, but in the end, and I will Karen will lead into this, they then in the same breath or same sentence upheld these convictions, deferred to the military, failed to do their constitutional duties as uh, Supreme Court justices. That led to what is discussed as, or called one of the, the two or three worst decisions by the Supreme Court in upholding the math, mass in, uh, banishment of 120,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry, two thirds of whom were American citizens without any due process. And that was the initial decisions that were made in 1943 and 1944. And if I could just add, uh, because one of the cases that doesn't, uh, doesn't always <coughs> get talked about is Mitsui Endo, uh, which was another Supreme Court case. And hers was a, a, a writ of, of habeas corpus case. So her demand was uh, to be really brought before a judge and, and, and to have a hearing before the, the court. You know, well, of course, all due process of law was denied. Uh, and, and, but she was an American citizen. She was, lived in Sacramento. She actually, had, I believe, lived, um, worked in a city job. Uh, she, you know, had no violations uh, against her uh, previously. And she just wanted her day in court. I mean, that's what everyone wanted, including my father. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, when her case was uh, decided it was going to be heard, which was on the same day of my father's case, so December 18th, 1944, uh, it, it, um, uh, the, the government um, got wind that the Supreme Court was going to uh, uh, consider Endo's case. And of course, then they announced that the uh, the Japanese American concentration camps are going to be closed. So it, it almost became a, a, a situation like a moot, you know, in other words, there wasn't any other fur further argument because everyone was going to be relieved, right? right? And, uh, and people get a little confused because uh, sometimes they'll refer, you know, in the beginning they refer, refer to it as kind of the Indo Korematsu case because they were heard on the same day, but they were definitely two different cases. Right. And and the point being is that she was the only woman, and mm -hmm. you know, in this year of you know, I'm promoting women and women's rights uh, and advocacy. Uh, so I uh, uh, want to point out that you know she was. They tried to persuade her to back down. Uh, oh, you can you can leave the you can leave the camp right. early and all these kinds of of uh, you know uh, and to be you know kind of enticed so that she wouldn't go on with her case because they knew that they were wrong the government was wrong um, but she stood her ground she was not going to be swayed and so she she stood up for her her rights and I think that's also a, a great mm -hmm. um, example of, of advocacy you know for you know at that time which was very scary. Yeah. Um, anything that either of you want to add to the, uh, the original case uh, before we move uh, forward? Any, any other well, thoughts just, about that? I could just kind of briefly, because, you know, I, uh, education is, is, is what I do these days. But, you know, for, for those people that are, uh, that are especially students, um, is, is, is to read the, the dissenting opinions um, in the original Supreme Court case of, of Korematsu versus United States. And you have to, you know, I also want to point out that for Hirabayashi and Menyasui, those were unanimous decisions. My father's was not. And, uh, and, and so, you know, Justice, um, uh, you know, uh, Robert uh, Jackson um, referred to my father's case as this lies around like a loaded weapon ready for anyone to pick up and use uh, with a plausible cause. I'm paraphrasing here, um, of course. But, uh, you know, and they, and certainly my father was, has case has been cited over the years, even currently, uh, but after, especially after 9-11 as a possible reason to round up Arab and Muslim Americans and put them in American concentration camps. 
uh, and uh, uh, Justice Murphy called it the ugly abyss of racism. Mm -hmm. uh, and Owen Roberts, Justice Owen Roberts, you know, just flat out said, this is unconstitutional. So those, you know, we what, what we want people to do is, is to learn, because these are lessons of history that aren't publicly talked about or, or, or presented because, you know, we haven't learned from the lessons of history, quite obviously. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so by, by understanding those decisions will, will help people to hopefully be prepared for what we're dealing with now. I, th I think Lane, one of the lessons for today, there's a lot of talk right now about how the, uh, the court, uh, the Supreme Court is a political body and they're trying to disabuse the public of that notion. But well, that's not true. They are as political as any other uh, body of the government. And you can go back to Korematsu and before that even to understand that this was a political decision. They didn't have evidence to uh, uphold the convictions. And yet they made a decision that would appease the leaders that were uh, in power then during a time of war. And uh, similar things have happening uh, recently. And of course, you know what's happening in the news right now. These bodies are political. They're not, they're not neutral. Great. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, ask you, Karen, um, can you talk a little bit about what Peter Irons meant to your dad? Um, I, I guess I would describe him as the, the person that I think my father had always been looking for after, <laughs> after, uh, after his case, uh, after he lost his case in 1944. Uh, you know, he, and, and actually until, until Peter showed up, um, did I, I didn't know that my father had never given up hope, right. never given up hope that someday he, he could reopen up his Supreme Court case, but he just didn't know how to do that. Um, lawyers were expensive. <laughs> and, uh, Some were. Yeah. <laughs> we were cheap. <laughs> and, uh, so he, I mean, he knew a few from church, but it's not like you're going to go up and say, well, would you take oh, help me with a court case, right? It doesn't work that way. Yeah. And, and, but, uh -huh. Peter, but Peter was yeah. persistent. You know, he, he first wrote a letter to my father and then he talked about, well, he also wanted to write a book. And, you know, my father thought, oh, well, here he goes again, because people always try to contact him because they wanted to interview him or, you know, wanted some information from him or, you know, some excuse like that or reason. And, uh, and, and he just wasn't interested. Uh, and so when, when Peter, you know, said that he was you know, going to be in the Bay Area and he wanted to visit my father and, and, uh, and show him some information. So actually, I, you know, Peter got there on his own. He, I mean, my father didn't even give him directions, you know, so it, it, it was interesting because actually I was, um, I was doing a, I was in my previous life was, was flying home from another project. And, uh, and my mother went to go pick me up. So when Peter arrived, there was, there was, there was just my father and Peter had a friend with him. Um, and so they looked through all this, um, this, mm -hmm. all this, you know, file of all this information. And, and, um, and my father took a long time to read through all this and it made Peter really nervous. Uh, but, uh, but then after, uh, after that, my father said, um, they, they did me a, a, a great wrong. And, uh, and so then he asked Peter if he would be his, 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 his lawyer. And Peter said, I'd be glad to, but, you know, Peter being Peter, he, he, you know, he knew that it really was the, the, the Japanese American attorneys that should take on this, uh, fight, you know, on behalf of my father. And then of course, men and, and, uh, and Gordon, and so that's how he recruited Dale, um, who was already doing this kind of fight, this advocacy work. So, Dale, t talk about that meeting, Peter. Well, you know, Peter called me, and I remember the day clearly because uh, I was at my desk. It was uh, in Oakland, and right next to my desk was uh, our, our office was a restaurant called Sorrow Ball. It was a Korean restaurant, and you could smell all the incredible food. And I remember, you know, smell is one of the, the most uh, lasting uh, senses you have. 
And it was it me, at that point, moment about 11.30 or so, Peter called me. I didn't know him. He identified himself as a professor of law and professor of political science. And he had heard about me through several people, but mainly through one of the main Minyasui, because I, because I had done a number of high profile cases earlier in my career or before that time. And he asked me if I could help him uh, put together a work team. My response, you know, after reading about these cases in law books, they're not attached to a human drama or a, even a person really, like Brown versus Board of Education. Who knows who Elaine Brown was? I mean, uh, who Brown was, but uh, Peter then said, uh, I said, let me, let me see the materials. This seems kind of in my mind, it was fantastical because I've always wanted to do something about that case since reading it in law school and reading it in political science. I thought this was a travesty and, and it involved my own family, my own community too, uh, as well as some uh, landmark legal decision that was abominable so Peter, I said, Peter, send me these, the documents. So Peter sent me the documents and they were astounding. I mean, there's no other way to put it uh, because they were mind blowing to see the government uh, lawyers say in writing that we are telling deliberate lies, falsehoods to the Supreme Court. Uh, we are altering, destroying evidence that is unfair to this minority group. And when we saw those documents, we thought, you know, we have a shot at this, but um, my problem was, Peter, I said, how did, are these guys still alive? Gordon, Ben, and Fred. And he goes, yes, they are. And they're willing to fight. I said, but how'd you find them? He said, uh, well, I looked in the phone book. And I said, phone book? You know, I mean, nobody knows what a phone book is. Now I have to explain it to audiences at this point of younger folks, but Peter being as resourceful <laughs> as he was, you know, found them in a phone book, called them up, arranged meetings, and got them all on board to uh, become petitioners. And so I was asked to lead the legal team at that point of all three people. We split across later, split apart later, and I became lead counsel for Fred uh, because it was in San Francisco, close to where I lived. And so we were able to then cobble together, not really cobble, we had a lot of volunteers who wanted to work on this case. Yeah. They, they were as astounded as I was. And so uh, we put together that team. We worked with Peter. We drafted all of the initial documents. And uh, we were so lucky to get a great, great judge because the quality of the judge you get or the perspective of the judge often determines the outcome. And we got Marilyn Hall Patel, who was uh, an amazing person. And so that's how the case started. But we we had to do this in secret because we didn't know how many documents would be, quote, disappeared because we, you know, we did this on the basis of fraud on the uh, fraud on on the Supreme Court by altering, destroying, uh, falsifying evidence, a manufactured record that was intentionally uh, and deliberately created to uphold uh, the incarceration of Japanese Americans. And so Peter and I worked together. We visited uh, the Korematsus, we visited Fred, and then one day we visited Karen, and in her protective way, she said, well, how are you guys gonna get paid? What are you doing this for? <laughs> and we said, we would do this for free. This is so important. And Karen's mom, was, wow. Catherine, was just wow. an amazing, amazing person. Um, and Karen, you could tell her more about her because she was one of our uh, you know, favorite people at the time. And she was so smart. Uh, and she was totally along with the ride that we were going to take in the, in those next ensuing years. Yeah, she was your, she was the, yeah, what was the, name? the Quorum yeah. Nobis cheerleader. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, make sure you're fed. Yeah, that's right. So that's how hey, Dale, we met uh, Peter. What was the Go ahead. Go ahead. Dale, what was the name of the woman that worked with Peter? Dale, what was the name of the woman I that forgot her uh, name. worked with Peter I that remember. uncovered these documents? God, oh, God. Michael oh, Yoshinaga Hertz. Michael Hershik Yosunaga. Yeah, she was. Um, That's it. That's somebody it. Somebody had met in 1974 on a trip to New York, and she showed up in D.C. in 1981, and somehow, you know, it was a person that I had known for 
uh, seven years, but never had any contact with until we got it to DC. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the coincidence is um, she actually, Ico was um, uh, hired by the War Relocation Authority to do some research. Uh, and so that's how she and Peter really kind of accidentally met in, uh, in the National Archives. Uh, and right. and uh, decided to you know to share information, so that made you know just the the, um, the the support materials that much stronger. Right, she found the most one of the most critical pieces of evidence because the report that was sent to the Supreme Court uh, made all these allegations about espionage, mm -hmm. and they also had a section that said, well, you know, it's not that we don't have enough time; it's a matter of you. Uh, uh, you can't tell the sheep from the goats, which meant you can't understand these people. They're so uh, uh, inscrutable. It's a stereotype they used for many years. So you can't tell the loyal from the disloyal. Well, they were forced to change that report to 180 degrees to say instead of there was an insufficient time, it wasn't a matter of insufficient time to then say exactly the opposite. We didn't have time to separate the loyal from the disloyal. Ten copies were were created, 10 puck copies were burned. They actually have a certificate right. of burning of this report because they had to get rid of the evidence. And then a, one copy remained right. for some reason. And Eiko found it. And she yeah. found the section that said, hey, this is uh, very different than what the original said. So, um, you know, so we, sh we should use this. And so that became the centerpiece of uh, our case, Gordon Hirabashi's case as well. And uh, Eiko, Eiko found that, and uh, she and Peter, who had collaborated on getting evidence, uh, helped us build the foundation of that case. The other interesting thing about Eiko is that while she was being paid by the government uh, to find uh, documents, she would secretly send them to us. So we had all this uh, internal documents that were not supposed to be released. Unfortunately, Eiko passed away a couple of years ago. She was a wonderful person, but she she was like yeah. a little spy. And if you ever saw her, she was like this grandmotherly little <laughs> petite woman, very cute. And no one would expect her to be like, you know, this undercover agent for our Quorum Nobis teams. So uh, rest in peace, Eiko. Yeah, yeah. 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 Definitely. yeah. I just, sure. I would, uh, I just uh, want, wanted just to take a, a, a minute aside here and, um, you know, the, the Corum Nobis team, uh, you know, like I said, my mother was the cheerleader, um, but one of, one of the members of the legal team was Bob Rusky. Yeah. And I'd um, like to honor him. He just passed away on November 22nd. And he, um, he was great. My, my mother was one of these people that ask 20 questions, I guess that's where I get it from. <laughs> uh, and, and Bob would take the time to, uh, you know, to answer all of her questions. He was very, very patient. And then, you know, in later years, if I had questions um, that he would, you know, he would help me um, as well, uh, you know, cause I'm, I'm not an attorney. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's, it's was good to have these inform the information. And then also to, um, to mention Holly Yasui, um, who also um, passed away on October 31st. We just had a tribute for her last night and virtually. And, uh, and kind of the relevancy is, you know, in carrying on our father's legacies, it was Holly and I and um, uh, Jay Hirabayashi that would, uh, you know, would be on panels and speak up and um, put our names to amicus briefs. And so we were the ones to, you know, carry on our father's legacy. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, Holly, Holly, I have to say, just, she was just like her, her father. She was a spitfire. <laughs> <laughs> right, Dale? It is true. It's true. Yes, I think the children of the original petitioners became strong proponents of civil rights, especially, I would say, Karen, because she's been tra traversing the country. She's kept the memory alive, not just of her father, but of our cases, the values, the, the principles, and has done so much to, uh, I should tell you this in private, it's just embarrassing to you, huh? <laughs> so she's been just a major, I mean, she's a, adopted this legacy of her dad and taking it, I mean, as far as you can take it. So that's just another point. 
Thank you. And we got a lot more work to do. It's, yeah, unfortunately. That's yeah. right. <clears throat> well, you took a, you already went ahead and uh, what got, got into a couple of my questions I had listed. So uh, maybe this is about the time we go kind of look at uh, the actual topic, what does Korematsu versus the United States mean today? Um, who, who wants to go first with this? And you want to talk about current cases or, or just kind of like what's going on in our country? Karen well, or, or, if I could just you know, start well, off. I think Karen. Karen yeah, has been doing start this. Off. I mean, Dale can, can all, you know, sure. I try not to monopolize the time sure. here. But what I, but I think I, I kind of intimated that, you know, my, I, I, who would have known? I mean, I, I think they, they would even admit this. It's like, who would have known that Fred Cormontu's legacy would, you know, would be, would right. have grown so much to even what it is now. And even, you know, even though the, the, what's amazing to me or what's, I guess, disheartening in a lot of ways also is that here Cormontu versus United States is one of, you know, the, one of the worst Supreme Court decisions in U.S. Mm -hmm. history and it's still being cited and cited incorrectly. Right. So I'll make, I'll make a, a, a specific point. So in, um, in, in 2020 and last year, um, the Wisconsin uh, State Supreme Court Justice, Rebecca Bradley, uh, actually uh, cited uh, Korematsu um, and, and equated it, uh, you know, to uh, that there wasn't, you know, enough time uh, to uh, de determine the loyalty of, of uh, the Japanese Americans, um, you know, that, that were sent, uh, you know, to the incarceration camps. Uh, and equated it to the um, how wrong the stay-at-home orders were, uh, that it was a violation of civil rights, uh, that the you know this was the the issue of of, of timing that they couldn't determine who was who had COVID, who didn't, uh, and 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 totally missed the whole point. And you know since we're the Korematsu Institute is has a grant where we're trying to get promote vaccinations through. Um, uh, through the health forum and the CDC is, you know, it, it is, is how, how the, the history has not been understood. Um, it's been misunderstood and misinterpreted because to, uh, you know, to, to force people from their homes, uh, they lose their properties and their dignity and live in inhumane conditions in concentration camps is not the same thing as being ordered to stay at home for your own health, protection, your families, and your communities. Not the same. And so this is how there's been other sightings of, of my father's case where it was totally uh, you know, incorrect uh, and the misinformation out there. So either those people were not paying attention in constitutional laws, laws <laughs> class, um, or they just don't get it. Uh, and, and this is, uh, this is my, my greatest, you know, con concern. You know, the Trump versus Hawaii case and Karen's take on it was so good. If you could, I'm going to leave that to you because I just love the way you phrase it. But what's interesting about it is it mirrors the decision on Korematsu, almost in the same pattern of explaining about how important rights are, you know, immigration is important, all these things that they, these, these fake, well, truisms they mouth, and then they decide something differently. And Karen has the best take on that. So, you know, uh, and that, that whole legal system, again, being political, is still with us. And we're seeing the kind of uh, uh, overflow of that racist river that has been with us from the start and uh, now is coming to haunt us in the aftermath of January 6th, um, where we saw so many incidents of anti-Asian violence and incidents. Uh, so, you know, we still have that history we've got to deal with. And what Karen said earlier on is I agree with, you know, we don't learn from history uh, or we don't act on it. So history, um, you know, there's an old tru truism, quote truism, that says if you don't, learn from history, you're, gonna, you're doomed to re repeat it. I don't believe that anymore. I believe people know the history, but because of political expedience or their own self-interest, they choose to ignore it mm -hmm. or they don't feel that it's important. Uh, so, you know, history is not, is a guide only to a certain degree, 
we got to live in the present and prepare for the future and understand that, you know, there are forces at work uh, and not being ignorant of history is not going to save you or, or is not going to uh, be the deterrent that will uh, create a better future for us all. Yeah, it can't be the excuse. Yes. Um, and uh, and you're, you're absolutely right, Dale, that, uh, you know, this is this is the point with the Cormontsu Institute. I mean, we're education advocates because we we want the the facts to be to be taught correctly, um, and not you know for misinterpretation. And unfortunately, what's happened also the danger of of, of these issues being politicized, uh, and uh, you know, in, in, in going back to uh, Trump versus Hawaii, uh, you know that was. Here, you know, that's an example of that was first started off as the uh, uh, as a Muslim ban. Then, then there was pushback. Then oh, yeah. became the immigration ban. Then we got pushback, and then uh, then became uh, you know the travel ban just because they added Venezuela. So uh, it's you know it's 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 it, it's what what happens. You know, here we are. You know, 2018, and and it was like almost like you know 1942 all over again. And it's just the names, you know, the the uh, the euphemisms, you know, we had um, military necessity in 42 and now no. it's national security. No. Uh, it's, you know, and to to recognize, you know, what what's happening, uh, you know, in in our country and how these um, issues are are turned around to uh, to benefit, um, you know, others and not in a positive manner because mm -hmm. it's against our our, you know, our, our civil rights and our civil liberties. Uh, and with the, with the Trump versus Hawaii, I mean, that's again here, that's where Holly and Jay and I put our names to the amicus brief to remind the courts of the, the danger of the overreaching of power, right? That there is a reason and people, you know, this is the other thing is that people don't even know the different branches of government. You know that that the dangers of of you know the the executive telling the judiciary what to do and the legislative is supposed to be you know acting you know on uh, on their own and 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 not for their own gain but but you know for our country. So uh, when in the decision, um, unfortunately, uh, Chief Justice Roberts um, you know was the majority opinion and and they upheld the Trump versus Hawaii. Um, um, because I mean, this is, it was basically, you know, against religion, it was a religious ban. Uh, and, uh, and so even I was, I was kind of uh, misled, because they said, oh, well, Korematsu versus United States was over, we, we, you know, was overruled. Um, and, uh, you know, it, right. it uh, you know, that was kind of the way that was presented to me. So then when I wrote my op-ed at the New York Times, the next day, it was like, well, that's, you know, the way that we were, we were looking at it until some of the constitutional scholars said, well, wait, whoa, wait a minute here. That's not really what happened. Uh -huh. uh, that, uh, that Chief Justice Roberts, uh, his, his um, um, you know, his, his decision was, was, was a comment um, uh, that said uh, Korematsu was overruled in the court of history. Well, that had nothing to do with the case. That's it was right. just in what they call, you know, for legal, for those legal people out there, it was, you know, the term is called dicta. It's an opinion. It's opinion of the court that's not related to the, um, you know, to to what the, the outcome of the original case is. Um, I mean, you can correct me, Dale, if I'm, you know, miss, miss saying. No, you're a better that. lawyer than I am. Uh, yeah, but, <laughs> I, you know, um, <laughs> but I mean, this is, this is what, you know, is, is, is uh, uh, so um, outrageous that, um, and especially as Dale was saying, for the courts to be so politicized. <clears throat> Uh, and we have to we have to you know see that that's what's happening and not let the the wool be pulled over our eyes all the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, Sotomayor says this: the dissent was powerful in the Trump versus Hawaii, and what she says is, and I quote: "This formal repudiation of a shameful precedent is laudable um, and long overdue, but it does not make the majority's decision here acceptable or right." by blindly accepting the government's misguided invitation to sanction a discriminatory policy, the Muslim ban, motivated by animosity toward a disfavored group, all in the name of a superficial claim of national security 
the court redeploys the same dangerous logic underlying Korematsu and re merely replaces one gravely long, one, one gravely wrong decision with another. I mean, this, this, she just brilliantly capsulized the hypocrisy of Trump versus Hawaii. Yeah, as I said, she went for the juggler. <laughs> she, she did. Yeah. You know, uh, I was uh, thinking back, I had some, just a little bit of the personal side. Because, um, you know, I interviewed you both for our lost years. And to me, when I look at the two of you, uh, you're, you're such great examples of, of uh, our generation. What I'm saying, what I'm trying to get to is, do you remember back uh, when you guys were uh, in college and hearing about the internment? Uh, Karen, uh, hearing about your father? Uh, you know, if you go back in time, and to, to me, it's amazing where you two are today. But can you go back just a little bit and share, uh, you know, when you learned about this in terms of what, it, what you felt, you know, what did that mean to you? Karen, tell you, about the, how you learned from your father. I knew about nothing. I knew nothing. Well, I, I learned about my father's Supreme Court case in high school. And uh, I was a, a junior uh, in a, a U.S. Uh, history class, and uh, our teacher had uh, assigned uh, uh, different paperback books uh, for us as a class to read, and, and then we were to get up in front of the class and give an oral book report uh, about our, our books. I mean, it was a long time ago. The teachers don't do oral book reports anymore. <laughs> um, but... Uh, uh, it was interesting. And so my friend, Maya, who is Japanese American, my generation, Sansei, third generation, uh, I'd known her since I was five years old. So she gets up in front of the class and there was only about six Asian Americans in my entire high school uh, in the East Bay. It was uh, Southeast Bay. And, and, uh, and so there weren't very many of us. And uh, in her, her book, she announces the title of her book as Concentration Camps USA. Now think about that. And, 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 I, and it got my attention. Of course, I was paying attention because she was my friend. And, uh, and, and I thought it was a strange title. Uh, and, and then she goes on to describe the Japanese American internment. That's what they, of course, called it then. Uh, and, and this terrible time in history and what happened um, to Japanese and Japanese Americans, you know, 120,000, uh, two thirds were American citizens. And then she said, but there was this one man who resisted the military orders and it ended up to be a Supreme Court case called uh, Korematsu versus United States. Oh, that's my name. And the only thing I knew was that Korematsu is an unusual Japanese name. And then I had 35 pairs of eyes turning around looking at me and I'm shrugging my shoulders thinking it's some black sheep of the family. <laughs> Uh, she never said Fred. And so then, if, if, the, you know, I just, of course, you know, just like I, I, when I talk to kids and teachers and, you know, it was one of those situations where, you know, your, your eyes glaze over and you don't hear anything else in class. Uh, and afterwards, I asked my friend Maya what this is about. She said, this is about your dad. I said, no way. And uh, I said, somebody would have told me. So, of course, I go running home and confront my mother and she says, <clears throat> yes, this is about your father. You have to wait till he gets home uh, to ask him. And not only did he have, uh, you know, housing discrimination, he had employment discrimination, sometimes worked two jobs, so it was late. And by the time he, he arrived uh, home and I told him about what I had learned, uh, you know, he, he was a very quiet person anyway and, uh, and, and soft-spoken. And he just simply said, it happened a long time ago. And what he did mm -hmm. thought was right. And the government was wrong. That clear and simple. And I couldn't ask him any more questions about that because it was like somebody gave me a, a soccer punch in, in my stomach. Um, except I did ask him if he could vote because voting was very important to my parents. Oh. So we never even discussed it again until 
Dale and those guys come to the house and, you know, after Peter and, and, mm-hmm. you know, in, until, you know, 1983, I mean, that was a, that was a, a big gap between, you know, that, that time. So uh, I, you know, I was what, 33 years old when, when my father's case was, was reopened and, and, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't really in any, in the advocacy like Dale, Dale's, I think you were born being an advocate, Dale, um, uh, but oh, you, know, <laughs> you know, the only thing I did in college was protest against the Vietnam war. Oh. Um, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and then it just, it's just something that's been a fire in my belly ever since. Yeah. Well, Lane, you know, like many Japanese, oh, you do. You American, got like many Japanese American families, and Nisei, and Nisei didn't talk about what happened to them. They were deeply shamed. They were humiliated. They were told they were criminals and traitors. And so they didn't reveal a lot of the details to us. And it wasn't until years later when the redress movement, the movement for Japanese Americans to get $20,000 in apology, did the Japanese community open up again. They, they, they obtained political redemption. They're regaining their political birthright and begin to speak up again, found their voices, found their tongues, and were able to then communicate. I think they felt not only victimized, but they also felt that you know, like like a rape victim in a sense, uh, not to an- analyze or analogize those two together, but they felt violated and they felt that, you know, maybe we did something wrong. And so those stories were not heard until the redress movement began and people started uh, finding their voices and telling their stories. So I didn't really know about, like Karen in a way, I didn't know about the horrors of this, about how the you know, the, the poor food, the bad medical care, uh, the open latrines almost um, until, until the redress movement opened. And I remember my parents were sent to Santa Anita. They had to live in racetracks, just like folks up here, like Fred had to live in Tan Fran. As he said in the court, horse stalls yeah. are for horses, not for humans. But they had to live with manure on the wall on the grounds. I mean, it was horrible. It was inhumane. It was inhumane. And my mom is the first time I saw her cry when she started talking about these in, in her typical understated Japanese way. She said, yeah, I guess it was pretty bad. Mm. Well, what it was, it was inhumane and horrible. Yeah, their dignity was just, you know. Just you know, that was maybe the greatest loss, huh, Karen? They just lost their dignity. Yeah, yeah. They were humiliated. Yeah, and and that, and you can't, you know, you, you, you know, it, no, I mean, it wasn't even with the redress and reparations and the civil liberties act, it, it, it wasn't about the money. It, it was the apology. Yeah. It was the apology that they wanted because they felt like many of them that, that they, it was their fault for the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Just, you know, like right. when I was growing up, I mean, right. I mean, to me, right. and, you know, that's why when, when I talk to kids these days that, that, you know, I, I know about, I know about the discrimination and the racism because I experienced it myself. Mm-hmm. You know, this anti-Asian hate that's going on right mm-hmm. now is, is nothing new. And unfortunately, and, uh, and, and we, we've got to uh, keep uh, making people accountable for these, um, this outrageous uh, violation of, of uh, really of, of human rights and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and learning somehow that, you know, we, we're all Americans and we all belong here. Uh, and being an American is, is to support citizens and non-citizens. Uh, this is, you know, this is, this is a, a, a privilege that we have in, have in this country. So um, it, it's, you know, and, and, but I need to point out also that at the time my father's Coram Nobis case was reopened in 1983, uh, you know, he uh, he was not supported by his own Japanese American community from day one. Even in 1942, when he arrived yeah. at at Tanfaran, he was vilified and and uh, ostracized from his own Japanese American community. Right. And they didn't want the, even the, the the even though the the start of the redress and reparations movement was was going on, they they said to you know to him, Fred, if you if you reopen up your case. Um, and lose, you're gonna, we're gonna lose our chance for redress and reparation. So he never had that. It was a, it was a Coram Nobis team that gave my father the encouragement 
Um, and and he was, even after his case was was um, was overturned and vacated in '83. It was the, again the Quorum Novus team that gave, that encouraged him to 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 speak up and 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 he gained his voice and his energy yeah. to crisscross this country with the legal team and my mother because he didn't want something like the Japanese American yeah. incarceration to happen again. And that's why he spoke out. Um, uh, you, you know, uh, with, you know, for other other ethnic ethnic groups, you know, like the, the Muslims and the Arabs, and um, you know, and African Americans and Latinx, um, because that was just the way he was. It was yeah. to him, it was about being an American. One thing that's important in the context of the Korematsu reopening was that we were in the middle of the redress movement and trying to get uh, the Congress to pass the bill to support Japanese Americans. The problem was that uh, the opponents of redress and Norm Mineta, the Congressman, and Bob, Mineta to, uh, Bob uh, Matsui told us this, that the opponents in Congress were saying, well, wait a minute, didn't the Supreme Court approve of the, of the incarceration or de uh, banishment in 1944? And there was very, very little rebuttal, except that, well, those decisions are criticized and wrong. What we needed was a judicial declaration explaining that misconduct had led to those decisions, that fraud on the court had occurred. And that gave our proponents of redress the ammunition to fight back and silence those opponents who were arguing that the precedent had already been set. And so it was critical for us to win that precedent, have our judge uh, write the opinion she did. And of course, it was uh, critical for us not to be uh, ostracized for losing the case twice and being banished somewhere else from our community because we took this chance to win these cases. We were criticized. We were uh, publicly told by an ex-justice of the United States Supreme Court that what we were doing was foolhardy. So as young lawyers, we were, uh, we were way too arrogant to even bother with what he said, but we did take it uh, as an issue that, yeah, we got to win this case. But the other thing is, I don't think we ever had a doubt that we were not going to win. We felt that we had the evidence, we had the judge, we had the client and his family. And so we felt that there was, uh, we were on a mission. We felt there was a destiny, there was a fate. And uh, maybe it's knock on woodism, like my daughters call it uh, as a religion. But uh, we thought we were going to win this. We had to win it. There was no other choice. That's great. Um... You know, we're going to start moving into some questions uh, from the audience. A uh, couple little things, though. Uh, uh, Karen, you know, uh, the first class I took at San Francisco State University, one of the first classes was called Concentration Camps USA and was taught by Edison Uno. Oh, yeah. And oh, book, was it? Yeah. And the book was Concentration Camp USA. That was the book we read. Wow. And that, uh, Wow, that's oh, that's great. There's there's only so many people you know that you meet, you know, that have an effect on you. Edison was one of them. Oh yes, and uh, the, one of the other people was I met your dad. Yeah, and he, oh, when I met yeah. your dad, I heard him speak, and he he had a tremendous effect on me uh, when I was a young, you know, crazy sanse, you know. But uh, I was just saying that you know uh, Edison was somebody who had an effect on me. And then uh, also uh, Fred, hearing Fred speak, wow, just 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 amazing. And uh, you know, it's interesting. You never know. Like I was trying to get to was uh, when you're young, you're so uh, you're able to take in it all, and then you don't know where it's going to lead you. You know, and and the fact that uh, the two of you have walked this path, you know, I, I really uh, I really bow down to the two of you. You know, for what you're doing and what you've done. Uh, for uh, the for not just the Japanese community, it's for all communities, really. When you're talking about civil rights, you know, and so uh, I just wanted to mention, uh, yeah, Edison. You know, uh, God, if it wasn't for him, I, I don't know where I'd be. You know, he kind of yeah. set me right. Because uh, I, I want to mention another thing too. You know, I, I interviewed uh, Amanda Suskin from the uh, Anti-Defamation League, wow. and uh, you know, we chatted lot about not comparing the camps to the Holocaust, but just the fact that how these kinds of events affect 
people in a community. Yeah. And what she said to me was, what these kinds of events, um, two things, she talked about the pyramid of hate, about how, you know, events, it starts with name calling and, and physical acts, but then it starts to turn into government action. And all of a sudden that pyramid of hate is at the top. And she said that, you know, the internment might not be the top of hate like the Holocaust was, but it's right there, right there at the top. But the other thing she talked about was it takes like a generation to talk about it. She mm -hmm. said those people who, who uh, were able to survive the Holocaust didn't talk about it. And their children, it was hard for them to talk about it. But it was it took a generation for them to realize, you know what? We have to talk about it because we can't let it happen again. And I think it's very similar to what happened to the Japanese American community. Mm -hmm. You know, the Sansei generation, our generation really kind of woke up, woke up and said, no, what, 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 what happened? Are you kidding me? They put you in a goddamn camp. Excuse my language. This is crazy. We had to do something. We had to speak up. We had to do, you know, what we could to understand this, you know? So uh, with that, um, uh, I thought we'd uh, kind of uh, start shifting over some questions for the audience. I know they're starting to uh, uh, get them in the chat room. Um, I'm going to reach out to Moni and see if she, uh, how she wants to handle this portion. But thank you, you guys, for all your uh, insights. This has been really tremendous. Well, thanks to you, Lane, too. You've been on the front lines for many, many years, too. And so, <laughs> I appreciate you fighting this. Hey, you know, while she fighting the battlefield, in, in, in you know, I'll tell you. Too. Yeah. All right. You know, as we get set up for the questions, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I just got cast in a play. Oh, I really? haven't done a play in uh, f like 15 years. Wow. I'm going to uh, play an old man. I'm going to oh. play an old Issei man in a play oh. called Desert Rock Garden here in San Diego. Oh. What I like about the play is what it talks about. It's about orphans and about desert rock gardens in the camps. A lot of people don't talk about that, yeah. you know? And so uh, 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 that's why I'm getting a little grubby. I'm going to start doing my, you know, a tribute to Pat Morita and oh, uh, do a little wow. goatee and mustache. But, uh, you know, at least I don't have to do any age makeup to play a 70-year-old Issei guy now. <laughs> But I'm really I looking forward do. to that, you know, because there's so many stories, so many stories from the yeah. camps, you know. That's and uh, that, anyways, yeah, yeah. That's so I think Moni's different. ready. Yeah, just but just to add to that, you're right. Uh, you know, I, I th this is a part of the education. I mean, this, the, the people remember the stories. It's the stories that resonate and and where we can learn the lessons of history and how how it brings relevancy to our issues today. Um, so certainly, I, the, you know, that's what we do at the Korematsu Institute is, is, you know, to work with the educators and students and, and even the general public, because they, 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 there's so much out there that people just don't know. And um, so, yeah, thank you, Lane. You, you, you've, you've done a, it's been great to, to, to work with you and, and Dale on this. I want to see the play. I want to see the play too. I, um, <laughs> yeah, we should all go see the play. Um, well, I loved hearing your conversation and your stories. I think everyone else did too, because we have a lot of fantastic questions. Um, I'm going to be very selfish and uh, lead with my own question though. Um, so many members of our audience today are students at Sac State. Are taking a class on Asian American politics and public policy. Uh, this is for any of you. Um, do any of you have advice for students or activists who may just be starting advocacy work? What are some ways they can make an impact on social change? Dale, you start. All right. Uh, yes, yes, boss. Uh, <laughs> That, that is a very broad question. I, I think you, you've 
uh, made the first hurdle, which is to do advocacy. You got to find it in your heart, the outrage, the interest in making social change or social for social justice. And then the second step is to act. I mean, just slacktivism doesn't work anymore. You can't just sign a petition. And I, I feel that one of the best things to do is to uh, link up with other folks who think like you and are committed to uh, social justice in the ways that you are seeking social justice. Uh, there's a reason that conspiracy laws exist because groups of people are way more effective than individuals. So just one piece of advice is to find people that uh, have the same goals or interests as you and uh, hook up with them. And by sharing and as a collective group, you'll be much stronger and much more effective. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. Um, no, it's, it, it's about, um, yeah, and finding the, those that cause it's gonna resonate with you because then you right. then you will have right. the interest and, 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 you know, the stamina to have keep fighting. I mean, nothing is, you know, this is the, the, you have to realize that whatever long, you know, whatever advocacy work you do is for the long haul. Um, it, nothing just is, you know, kind of instantly resolved. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and what I would encourage though, um, just because of where we are in, in, in our society is, you know, if you get involved in, in voting and, 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 uh, you know, in helping to get, um, uh, you know, people to, to vote, you know, find those organizations that have that kind of advocacy work, um, legal women voters are, is a, is a good source, but, you know, voting is is crucial as we, as we've seen, and also maybe to to find um, you know a, an elected official or someone who's running for office because they need help too. We you know our, where we're going to make change is in our elected officials. I think that's quite obvious, uh, and uh, and so you'll find those causes and and those. Um, projects that mean something to you and then and and maybe those people that are running for office that believe in your community I mean it doesn't have to be national you know it can be board of supervisors it could be city council it could be you know just in your own backyard you know as she uh, looks at the next question a little thing that happened uh, I'm working on a stop AAI AAPI hate project. Right. And uh, one of the people I interviewed was a high school student from Carlsbad. And when all this was going on in, uh, you know, uh, after uh, May, June of last year, how it started to get worse and worse and worse, this high school student put together a march downtown Carlsbad wow. and brought all these people together and got speakers to talk about how this is wrong, what's going on. I, I really give her credit. And uh, she's gonna be uh, something one of these days. Yeah. Well, speaking, speaking of, 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 of vaccinations, um, if I could just kind of jump in here and give a plug uh, for Fred Korematsu Day, which is on January 30th, uh, 2020, uh, we're going to do a virtual program, so all you have to do is go to koromatsuinstitute.org, uh, you know, to to register. But you know, our theme this year is stand up for what is right, get vaccinated, uh, and it's it's important that you know for all of us to kind of get back into some type of normalcy, whatever that is. That you know, we all need to be uh, vaccinated and boosted, and you know, for libraries, right? You, you know, to get back to that situation. But no matter what we're doing, um, it's important that we all protect each, each other and and uh, and our families. So uh, we're, uh, you know, we we we're going to continue this kind of advocacy work. Um, not you know, we, we are we're a national organization, and so. Um, um, you know, especially for that and for, and for ethnic studies nationally. Thank you so much. So this first question from the audience comes from Gina and Callie. I feel that our school system did not do a good job about teaching us about Asian American history, such as this case. Do you think that this will change in the school systems? Do you find it important to teach the younger generation about these issues and events early so that they can accurately grasp what has happened in our country? Karen, this is yours. 
uh, yes. And, 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 you know, our, I, I have spoken to kindergartners and first graders. And let me tell you, they, they get it. They're like sponges. Um, and it, so it's not too young. You just, you, you have to be mindful of their age. Of course, you don't you know, talk in, in scary, outrageous terms. But if you just give them the facts, um, they, they, they know what's, you know, uh, what's right and wrong. And, and, and for, for young, for young ones, I had to learn what's fair and unfair. Probably Dale knows that, um, experienced that part, um, with his, with his girls, but it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a daughters. We that see we, daughters. Yeah. That we start to, um, uh, at an early age to teach these lessons and to, and to, and, and then, but it's not just about history. It's about what's happening now because kids, you know, they're seeing the social media. They're not, you know, they, we can't feel like we have to protect them. Um, you know, it's, there's a way of, of uh, talking about these issues and, uh, and certainly with the Korematsu Institute, we, you know, our curriculum is K through 12 and then now higher education. Uh, and the public, general public. So it's it's never too early, and 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 but we need to bring in kind of those issues that are happening now in our country. I agree that I think education of young people in ethnic studies may be the best long-term solution to the issues we're having of factionalism among among races. They don't understand each other, but there hasn't been much money put into this whole idea. I just had a conference today with some of uh, Rob Bonta, the Attorney General's people, and they were talking about, and some of the Stop API Hate, they got a grant for $10 million, and part of what they're gonna do, and Karen, you should be a part of this too, is, mm. is to do education uh, in the uh, K through 12 about Asian Americans. I don't think it should be li limited to Asian Americans, for example, a Asian Pacific Americans, you should be all, First people of color, I feel, because of the racism that has been uh, the building block and the history of this country, as, as well as sexism for that matter. I feel that, um, uh, you know, if you teach folks and humanize uh, other races and other people, it makes it a lot harder to uh, act out in an aggressive way against somebody that is your neighbor or somebody that you know or somebody that you know about. And so I just think that uh, this idea never arose until in, in, in a big way until the third world strike at San Francisco State, which Lane is familiar with too. And until then, the narrative was always dominant, non-Asian, non-Black, non-Hispanic, non-Native American. It was always a white narrative that told a really distorted view of what history was. And so to bring in the contributions the culture, uh, the human uh, aspect of other uh, people of color, I think is absolutely critical for young folks to learn. And I'm, I'm really happy what Karen is doing with her, her projects too, because I just think that's critical to, to stop uh, depersonalizing uh, and uh, dehumanizing people of color, because that allows you then to commit all kinds of terrible deeds and, and, and violence and incidents against them. Yeah, the the intersectionality of our histories is is really you know strong, and I think that's where we need to make those connections. Um, in in order to you know it, it's about you know appreciation appreciating everyone's di you know differences, mm -hmm. not to be afraid of them. Um, that we actually have more in common than than not, uh, and you know some of our experiences. They maybe call different names, or are you know, and and certainly our our um, ethnicities are different. But you know the the struggles, you know, especially for immigration and and even in in, in everyday life, these are these are uh, uh, you know are the same, and and that's why we're promoting the ethnic studies not only for California but across this country. Um, that's going to be the uphill battle. I mean, we now have ethnic studies for the state of California. I've got 49 states to go. <laughs> yep. I heard today I 11, so. states, 11 states have done this now. Yeah. But I'm not there, sure at yeah. what level. They're, yeah, it, different, different. Um, right. Different programs. Pro programs. 
I thank you so much. This next question is for Dale. Dale, how did it feel as a Japanese American to lead the team of lawyers that forced the overturn of Mr. Korematsu's criminal convictions? Uh, you know, I, I had been involved, I think I was young and really arrogant to the degree that I felt that this is, this is my mission in life now. And uh, I had done a number of impact cases, public cases, where you had to do both education and litigate. And I felt that with the evidence we had, and you know, it's really uh, helpful to have smoking gun evidence because then your cases are a lot easier. And I felt that um, you know, I had been in a position of leadership on cases. I had done work to form organizations like the Asian Law Caucus. And so I had a, uh, as young as I was at 34 years old, I had enough experience, I felt, to be able, in a vision of what we should do that I felt very confident. You know, there are very few times in your life, I feel, where you have that, that clarity of vision, where you can not only see the, not just see the future, but you know, you have a real sense of the path you need to take. And with the Korematsu here by Yasui cases, I saw it pretty clearly about how we had to do it. And the work team had, uh, had been significant as far as putting this all together because it wasn't just me with one idea. It was ideas, I had some crazy ideas that they kind of, you know, tampered down to make it way more a better product than it would have been. So it was incredibly exciting to do this. And, uh, but we really, uh, you know, I really just had to calm down and try to figure out how are we going to do this strategically, legally, and politically. So I was, uh, I was honored and I was really happy. And we had great clients with Kara and Fred and Catherine and Ken. So uh, it was a joy. It was probably the most exciting part of my life, I, I would say. Thank you so much, Dale. Um, this one is to um, all three of you. It's from Nye and Shaw. They're asking, do you believe enough reparations were given to Japanese Americans? Um, and then the second part to this is, how did Japanese Americans feel after the reparations bill was passed? Did some feel that the money was enough or were people still trying to seek true justice or over the horrible treatment of Japanese Americans? I just talk. Somebody wants to go. <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell you uh, something. Uh, when you talk about the reparations part of it, I mean, Karen mentioned this before, that it was the apology. That was the main mm -hmm. thing. But one of the persons I interviewed said, well, reparations, the money was great, was fine, but I don't know how you replace a house on Lombard Street in 19, whatever, 88, 89, when the, the $20,000 came in that they lost. When you think about what that house is, was worth in 1988, 89. So it was nothing compared to what some people lost. I remember talk, I, I talked with, uh, oh gosh, uh, George Aratani in L.A., Oh, yeah. His family lost a strawberry farm. His, his grandfather's strawberry farm was lost. And it took it while he was in the camp because his dad had passed away. He was 18 years old at the time. And that, that affected him throughout his life. And so it, it really depends on how great that loss was. But um, I don't think really they'll ever repair the years that they lost right the three to four years right. that that they spent in these prisons you can never replace that you know whether no matter how old you were if you were an older person right. you lost something that was uh financial you know if you're young you lost you lost a part of your youth and so yeah. you know it's a tough call you know 
Yeah, the mon- the the amount of money, the twenty thousand dollars, didn't you know c- cover that you know those kinds of losses. I mean, it, it just uh, and of course, uh, what w- was uh, really shocking for some people was that you had to be living in order to receive uh, the the reparations. Uh, you yeah. know, if you died the day before, yeah, it was, the bill was passed, and you didn't, your family didn't receive anything, and your families didn't receive anything. I mean, that's why you know where you you can equate it to. Um, HR 40 and and the, um, the right. reparations for for African Americans and and you know how how to handle that. Um, I've been on different committees and yeah. you know have to explain well you know that was there was a, had to be a lot of compromise and the only way you know, actually it started off that um, the the the, um, the uh, reparations was going to be fifty thousand dollars but then they kept finding people that um deserve the the reparations and so that money got you know dwindled down dwindled down i mean even the i mean dale can talk to this even our civil liberties public education fund money was supposed to be like 50 million and i think it ended up to be five um Mm -hmm. something ridiculous like that so it's this is the this is the government you know for you and uh it's you know they'll 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 waste a lot of money but they don't you know they don't really use money like you know, for, for the human interest that they, that they should. Yeah, I think the money is, is not enough, of course, to lose that type of liberty. But that, then when you look at it, there's no amount of money that could pay for that amount. No, no. Uh, but what I think is important to look at it from the other side is that this is one of the first times America, the United States, has granted money mm-hmm. to and admitted a mistake and made an apology. And to that extent, it was restorative justice in the level. And so I think a lot of Japanese Americans, like my mom, who said that, you know, it's okay, but, you know, my dad's not around to see it. So that's unfair. And even then, the 20,000 is not going to be enough, but there's never enough that will pay for that. But I think if you look at it from a symbolic value, the United States has admitted an error, the most powerful country in the world, has admitted a a mistake and has tried to do some restitution or rectify, uh, rectify the situation. One issue that remains outstanding, although, is uh, if you didn't know that these Latin Americans from Peru, 2,000 of them were kidnapped. I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna mention. Collaboration between the United States and Peruvian government. They were brought here, their passports were taken away, they were put in prisons, and they became uh, stateless people. And they weren't allowed to go back because Peru wouldn't take them back. So they had, were in limbo. And they were given or offered 5,000, not 20, no apology, but at this point, they're still in limbo and they're still fighting their battle uh, because that was a horrendous travesty. Yeah, and the, and the Peruvian government confiscated all their possessions. That's right, that's and true they too. And so the Peruvian government didn't want, want them to go back because right. Right. They, there was nothing to go back to. Yeah. So it's, you know, right. again, this outrageous uh, uh, you know, act of inhumanity um, it is, uh, you know, we, we, you've got to push forward to, to, to make people accountable for these, um, atrocities. Um, wasn't reparations just for the U S citizens? No, I don't think so, but I, I don't. Yeah, I forgot. The Peruvians have Did, carried oh, in America? No, no, I meant uh, for the Japanese uh, that were interned, uh, that were, immig- you know, like our grandparents. Uh, I thought that uh, reparations just went to the U.S., if you were a U.S. citizen at the time. No, that, that wasn't, no. no, that wasn't the case. You just had to be living. Okay. All yeah. right. You had to be incarcerated, mind you. Yeah, I know that. You had to be in one of the 10 camps. Yeah. So I had an aunt by marriage right. in Salt Lake City. So therefore, she received no reparations. You know, uh, but some, some people did. If they, were, right. uh, uh, if they were not allowed to return because of the discriminatory laws, they, they actually did get uh, reparations, even though they weren't specifically imprisoned. Okay. Um, the officer of okay. the US administration really did an amazing job to find these people. Who were not able to return? Yeah, they, they uprooted them. Yes. Right. Right. Okay.
Thank you. We just have a couple more minutes. So I'm gonna ask one last question. Uh, this one is for Lane. Uh, it says, Lane, you're a masterful filmmaker and I really enjoyed only The Brave and you're acting in it. What is the next film that you are working on? Um, well, Our Lost Years was the uh, documentary I did on the internment and the uh, 10 year fight for redress. So we were touring that uh, last year and then COVID hit. So we were about to do 30 cities. We did eight and we had 22 cancel or postpone. So now in 2022, we're gonna pick up that tour again. And in the meantime, I'm fundraising for a film called The League of Dreams on the 100 year history of the Japanese American Citizens League. And uh, that is uh, in the works. And as I mentioned, I'm doing a piece with, on Stop A AAPI Hate called AAPI United, because I want to uh, look at all the different Asian groups here in the Southern California and San Diego specifically. It's funded by Kaiser Found Permanente and Asian Americans Advancing Justice. And then as I mentioned, I can't believe it, I'm gonna get on stage. I'm supposed to leave the stage uh, acting for all the young guys. Uh, it's called Desert Rock Garden. And it's going to be uh, done by New Village Arts. And I believe Roy Seki Gahama, the playwright, is uh, on this uh, uh, webinar with us tonight. So a little shout out to Roy. And so uh, I just hope I can remember my lines because I can't remember what I had for dinner last week. You know what I mean? But it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, good for you, Lane. Yeah. Good for you. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, this concludes our finale for the Rebellious Miss Breed, San Diego Public Library and the Japanese American Incarceration. Just wanted to thank uh, Dale, Lane and Karen again. Thank you so much um, for joining us tonight and for this impactful and inspiring conversation. Thank you Sac State students for joining us tonight um, and to everyone in the audience. Uh, I hope you have a really good evening and um, we would love your feedback. California Humanities would love your feedback. There is a link to take a survey in the chat. Um, please do so. And uh, again, if you have um, questions, um, uh, you can, uh, we can uh, answer them at, at a later date. Um, you can also reach out to me. I'm gonna put my email in the chat here and have a great evening. Thanks so much for being here with us. Thanks, Thanks, Money, thank to you, you too. Thank you, thank you, thank you Dale, so much. Sharon. Thank right, you. Thank See you. Money, thank you. Thank you so Bye much, now. Lane. Bye. Bye.